Good day, everyone. It's Patrick Global coming at you on uh, January 5th, 2023 at approximately 1130 a.m. my time. And the news and the headlines at the moment are more of the same in the uh, battle for the Speaker of the House with Kevin McCarthy and the, I would call it, Coke-led uh, sort of right-wing um, version of the Republicans that will forever want to jam up, uh, you know, the government, quite frankly, for if you want to understand how it works, you should probably look back four or five decades into Coke Enterprises and what they're all about. But ultimately, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, if this has any sort of impact on the debt ceiling, which really is the ultimate, I guess, fuel that keeps it all running. But at the same time, there's a lot of people benefiting in ways that we're trying to prevent. So ironically, and I was watching last night, I, I tuned in from time to time to Fox News uh, just to kind of see how they operate and what they're saying and how they're configuring things and all the rest of it. And usually I find it to be the most angry, vile, manipulative, deceitful sort of um, fear mongering and hate mongering that you can squeeze in between commercials. But yet they're incredibly effective with people that tune into that sort of frequency. Right. And yet if that's the information you get from the world, it's unbelievable how incredibly vulnerable and naive you are to how things actually work and that you're just being manipulated for an outcome so that you're a tool in the full circus. Same goes for the Dems. Same goes for anybody who buys into the Wall Street meritocracy, given everything that I've uh, provided to you. And um, as it furthers its way through the um, through the, uh, the, the the sort of maze to get you to the, the ultimate revelation, <clears throat> which is what I've continued to lay on to you. For some time, and I'll circle back to what that means in a minute, the, but where my mind is at the moment, and, and actually there's there's even more in the headlines as there always is, but one that caught my attention today is that there was a Utah man that murdered his wife, his stepmother, and five children, and, uh, you know, it's those sorts of scenarios that I think, like, you know, what and why and, oh, my God, and that's horrible, and somebody snapped because the pressure got too great and maybe he had all sorts of problems to begin with, who knows, but at the same time, this world puts a lot of pressure on people. And I can't imagine feeding five children um, if you're absolutely desperate and uh, you've reached your wit's end. And, you know, is that justifiable? Hell no, it's not. But at the same time, it's just an expression of the sort of impossibility, if you will, of a system that operates under the rules of the corrupt. And I happened to watch last night, I began watching, and I was looking forward to this. But there's a new um, television investigative series on Netflix uh, called The Monster of Wall Street about Bernie Madoff. And it's incredibly timely. You know, it, it, Bernie Madoff was kind of a thing for a long time. And then he started to be referred to as the largest Ponzi scheme in history, which is not true, which I'll get into in a minute. But there was other works that were done on HBO, for example, Robert De Niro paying, playing Bernie Madoff. And, uh, you know, when I saw the initial um, – uh, sort of reflection of, of the story of Bernie, I was felt, I felt, you know, like the people who had made that, which is pretty much constantly the case in media, that people don't understand producers, uh, those in the, in the fold, uh, aren't investigative journalists and they don't approach it from that uh, respect. They, they do it mostly from the interactions and the human, the human toil and the drama between family members and those sorts of things other than the mechanics of what actually created what they're referring to as the Ponzi scheme. And a Ponzi scheme is really robbing from Peter to pay Paul. Okay. in it's very simplest concoction, but what was incredibly elegant and amazing and kudos to the filmmakers of this new beta made off documentary series, limited series is that they really went deep dive in places that I haven't been aware of in the Madoff story. Now, interestingly enough, because I have relationships with some of the top criminologists in the country and they deal frequently with people that are whistleblowers. And I got wind of some people that were SEC whistleblowers with regards to the Madoff story. And it was infinitely more complex than the original sorts of framings that media and, you know, let's just say, um, uh, you know, the, the, the basic, you know, lay of the land in, 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 in general mainstream media uh, was trying to interpret the Madoff story. I understood it to be much more complicated than was led on initially. But through this new series, they really dive and delve deeply into a very sophisticated yet easy criminal scheme. Sophisticated in so much of covering your tracks and using documentation fraud 
in the way they did it uh, in the maneuverings with investors who started to eventually ask questions because certain things didn't add up because of certain questions in, in business media at the time that started to kind of, you know, wave a flag at Bernie. But at the same time, Bernie went down at the time of the 2008 great financial crisis. And the one thing that I took away from the Robert De Niro uh, execution on HBO was he basically said at the end of that series, you know, look, I was the fall guy. I was the guy that, uh, you know, Wall Street didn't really want you to, uh, well, sorry, that Wall Street was able to put out for the mainstream media to skewer, if you will, uh, while they got away with what they got away with, which is, of course, what we've revealed. And I believe that's probably what Madoff thought at the time. I can tell you that, you know, his con had been going on for a very long time. Uh, it was out in the open and it created all of these different sorts of structures and DNA and the way you build these things in a way that we present in the con. In fact, the similarities were so, you know, mirrored that even the episode capsules for the Bernie Madoff uh, series are very similar to what we did in the con. And it, it's just like, it's, it's almost like almost point by point, similar things that we did in the con, which would justify that we should have landed on the Netflix or HBO, you know, two years ago when we first distributed it. But we didn't. Why? Because our story is infinitely larger than what they proclaim is the largest business, uh, excuse me, Ponzi scheme in history. And the name, Wall Street's, you know, monster. Okay, I mean, yeah, you know, it's the hook and it's what producers do and it's salacious and it's all of those other things. But the actual execution itself is quite frankly brilliant. The filmmakers, again, uh, magnificent. I would not be surprised if they watched and studied the con. <laughs> I, think, I honestly think they did. And I honestly think the people that surrounded um, um, Donald Trump may have as well. I'm only speculating based on some of the things that they've done and I can see a corollary. But hey, man, it could be just coincidence, you know? I mean, what I'm learning about these sorts of things, it's like my, my partner and I are constantly talking about whether it's Ming the Merciless, kind of like a central uh, organized top-down mastermind conspiracy, or is it just the culture? It's usually the latter, but it's interesting that people will make the same sort of mistakes and decisions under similar circumstances throughout whatever the scheme may be. The models, you know, might fluctuate slightly, but the decisions in the moment based on pressure and the walls closing in and everything else lead to, you know, outcomes that are always similar, you know, and I, I think to myself, like, the criminologists that, you know, we work with, you know, they see patterns and patterns and patterns and you know where to look. And that's why, for example, when I did an interview with uh, the former director of investigations for the Department of Justice, a gentleman by the name of Paul Pelletier, who wrote a fantastic op-ed in the Atlantic last year, uh, proclaiming that we needed to get a, uh, have a Manhattan-like project to deal with white collar crime and financial fraud in this country, which is like literally 11 years after the greatest criminal conspiracy and cover-up in history manifested trillions of dollars to the bad guys, which is infinitely larger than the Madoff scheme. And he's right. We have to have, you know, an absolute critical understanding in the United States that our financial system has been a runaway train wreck of calamity and pollution and fraud and our media covers for it. And so then you get to see little bits and pieces of it that, you know, the machine, the Borg, green lights because, yeah, you can get a huge audience for Madoff. He's also very relevant because everybody's talking about Madoff because everybody's comparing what's happening in the crypto markets and Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX and really, quite frankly, all of the other, um, uh, you know, Bitcoin manifestations to, you know, to Madoff and Ponzi. And again, they're not parallel, but second verse, same as the first. But if it, you know, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes, all of those types of corollaries because they all manifest slightly different, but quite frankly, the same. They're all conspiracies, okay? But in the case, quite frankly, of FTX and, and, and Bitcoin and all of the different uh, sort of strategies that, you know, uh, Luna and Tether and... Um, you know, all of the big boys over the course last year have been engaged in. They had to know what exactly the Federal Reserve did in the aftermath of the financial crisis. I'm convinced of that. And this is what everybody's missing in mainstream media or, quite frankly, the independent hubs um, of podcasters that are asking the right questions. But they can't add two and two together. Like, for example, I was watching this 
really great interview yesterday on the Crystal and Kyle show, and I can't think of the guy's name who they interviewed, but he was a sharp guy as it relates to crypto. And the way he was describing things, you would think, because I was a guest on Kyle and Crystal, where I explained to them exactly what took place to create the 2008 great financial crisis and what it led to. And they've had some interest in the Federal Reserve since, but they still can't put two and two together. Meanwhile, this guy is explaining exactly how the Denzians, denizens of this uh, crypto uh, you know, sort of empire, if you will, uh, and Bitcoin most most especially, because all of these guys were creating tokens to create, uh, you know, through their market breakers, some sort of value to where investors could be, um, you know, utilized for cross trades, which is exactly what took place during the 2008 great financial crisis. But again, as I've, you know, laid on you several times, you know, the, what we're comparing is literally a tiny, tiny fraction compared to the universe. So, for example, in Sam Bankman Fried's case, Fried's case, fraud, you know, it's always hard to kind of put those two together when your mind's moving a mile a minute. But he, um, you know, had a $9 billion hole in the FTX balance sheet. $9 billion. It's a lot of money. $9 billion, okay? What I have revealed to you time and again, I'm trying to get you to understand, is that the corollary was there were $600 trillion in derivatives trades in 2006 based on the same architecture. Now, granted, there was tens of millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions worldwide involved with the scheme, many of whom didn't understand what the fraud recipe was, but they followed instructions and they played ball and they did on a much lower level exactly what is laid out in the Bernie Madoff scheme in this new documentary. So, you know, I feel like I'm pissing in the wind and I'm talking to a wall and nobody understands what I'm saying and it's the emperor's new clothes on really bad acid, but I'll keep plugging it. Because I have got the fucking answers the entire world needs to pay attention to. It's the largest criminal conspiracy and cover-up in history that is our system. All of this other stuff is periphery. It's on the outskirts, man. It's like symptomatic of the whole. But when you have the Federal Reserve that can pump trillions of dollars into the actual shadow sector, which are the asset managers and the quantitative easing and the hedge funds and everybody that's using that free money to filter into all of these schemes, you wind up with this insanity to where something like, you know, crypto could actually run its course. So close to the aftermath of the 2009 financial crisis, which makes me think that the people that were involved in the so-called Satoshi Nakamoto, and I know there was an evolution of, uh, you know, the computer scientists that were creating alternatives through blockchain. And there's definitely, ironically, really great purposes with blockchain that you can actually find out who traded what, when, and how to basically do the forensic accounting on this. But it's easy to hide that as well. So it's not amazing uh, technology. It's just dumb people getting caught, quite frankly, as opposed to, um, you know, being a little bit more uh, sophisticated and being able to hide the flag, which is in the end is all th that's all this is. That's financialization. What we did was we, sh we farmed out the golden goose. We don't produce what we consume. That went to Asia for the most part. Then we had this, you know, huge platform that's been baked into our system since post-World War II, which is fossil fuels. And a lot of that came mostly from the OPEC producing countries, which created this international, you know, uh, globalization that was predicated on fossil fuel. That's our paradigm. And financialization in between, which is just basically a corrupt system that leads to the insanity that we're seeing in the House with Kevin McCarthy having to go now, I think, through seven different, um, you know, uh, wipeouts, strikeouts. I mean, how many times they get to swing on this before trying to tr change the trajectory of Kevin McCarthy being the Speaker of the House? Who knows? Who cares? I don't know. Is the government not going to be able to function? Are they not going to be able to raise the de debt limit? Then everybody goes bankrupt and we have calamity? I, that, yeah, it could happen. But I think it's going to happen anyway. I mean, yesterday, just yesterday, I think it was uh, reported that, you know, and stuff that I was paying attention to, that Tesla has had the largest loss of wealth and value in a corporate um, situation in history. Over the course of the last, I don't know, six months, it's lost $700 billion of wealth. Unbelievable, right? And then, of course, Elon Musk is all over Twitter and that $45 billion to $54 billion purchase of Twitter that I think is tanking Tesla, to be quite frank with you. That has a lot to do with it. It was overvalued anyway, but it was overvalued mostly because of what took place during the financial, uh, re, uh, excuse me, the response of the Federal Reserve uh, in the aftermath of the great financial crisis. It's part and parcel to easy money in and then the quantitative easing, buying a lot of these bonds from the primary dealer brokers that just, you know, greases the wheels for easy money to throw into things like crypto. 
It's just nonstop bullshit that doesn't fuel the real economy. We have to reboot the paradigm of the United States, and it's got to start with honesty and integrity. And we can flush this system out of our we can flush we can flush the pollution out of our system. We have the means and know how to do this. All frauds are going to come to an end one way or the other, right? Why do we have to wait for them to blow up the world when we know people and patterns to be able to actually get inside of these situations, blow them up in advance, and then actually have accountability the way the law is designed to where CEOs of these operations like Bernie Madoff end up in prison? And that's what's going to happen, of course, to uh, Sam Bankman-Fried. But the interesting thing about Sam Bankman-Fried with the duopoly and him, you know, uh, uh, putting in a not guilty plea and then all of the things, excuse me, donating money to the duopoly and all of what that constitutes. Look, the, li the, 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 the long and the short of it is the Koch brothers have been spending money for decades to get to a point to where they could blow up the country. That's their idea of what America should be because they're basically just Confederate plantation owners. That's what they want to be. Who worked incidentally, ironically, with Stalin to build their empire. That's a whole other story. The bottom line is corruption has got to end. We have to find the character to where we stop going after quick, rich, get rich, quick schemes based on fraud and do long term greedy because you're either going to have to fucking come up with a solution to the system. We've got problems like climate change. We've got problems with like what, you know, never ending war for what to basically maintain the paradigm for the fossil fuel uh, structure that is creating the system. We've got to reboot. We got to recreate the world, and the way the world could be recreated, re recreated. Quite frankly, you know, just to mix, you know, what the hell's going on here in terms of like rebuilding the infrastructure of the United States. I've seen figures that it's like four point seven trillion dollars to reboot the uh, energy grid, which is long overdue. We could have done it twenty years ago. Meanwhile, we spent thirty trillion dollars in two thousand nine to backstop fraud, and I think we've spent another thirty to forty trillion since. I don't have the uh, you know the forensic numbers on that. Since 2019, there's just been a whole lot of insanity that preceded COVID, then COVID, and now we're here. And what's going to happen next, guys, is if the market implodes and everything goes down because we've got supposedly the mother of all bubbles because of what's been going on with this fi you know, financial engineering based on monetary policy that goes to all of these other you know, get-rich-quick schemes that blow up in, their, in our faces, I, I think it's in every commodity. That's happening around the world. I mean, we saw, you know, like two months ago, we saw the run on Credit Suisse and the, um, you know, the UK gilts and uh, that's retirement and pensions and the EU, excuse me, the uh, Bank of England had to step up with the uh, emergency bailouts. That's what's going to happen again. The Federal Reserve is going to be like, wait a second, we can't let the world, you know, explode, even though we're trying to, you know, increase the interest rates to basically tone down the uh, speculation so that, you know, we have less inflation is the idea. And, and if they continue to do that, everybody in finance is like, well, something's going to break. Why is something going to break, Wall Street? Because you created something going to break because it's inevitable because of your short-term hyena fucking greed, which takes us back to Bernie Madoff and the fraud. It's all the same shit. The difference is what I'm revealing to you is monumentally larger and I need to be heard. We need to spread the word. People need to get educated about what it is that we put down in the con so you know the, the A, B's and, A, B's and C's of how this fraud works and ultimately how the government covered this up. Because the government is complicit in the scheme, especially when the Federal Reserve can pump trillions of dollars illegally to the guys that are destroying the world. That's what I'm trying to end. I hope that makes sense. Onwards and upwards.